Well, one of my favorite times of year is Easter, which I realize we are probably as far away from Easter as we can possibly get in a year, but all will become clear. Uh, one of my favorite times of year is Easter. Love the whole spirit of it, love the meaning of it, love getting together as a family to celebrate it. But the one thing that I do really enjoy is the Easter egg hunt. Now, I never had Easter, head, Easter egg hunts in England growing up. I think there was maybe one time my mom like, hid an Easter egg, but nothing like you guys do in America where there's whole trails of eggs to follow, to follow or there's eggs hidden throughout the house. Uh, but Janae's family did, and so even now after the kids are grown, they still do it. Uh, they still hide little eggs around the house, and some of them have a little bit of money in them. Now, I'm, we're talking very little money, a few dollars, maybe a $10 bill. Um, but to me, I'm psyched about the $10 bill. I want the $10 bill. Um, I work in youth work, right? So $10 bills can go a long way, um, but I get really excited about it. Now, uh, we had uh, a couple of kids a few years ago, right? So now we have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And really, the Easter egg hunt now is all about Jonathan and Ben, uh, which is a bummer for me. Um, so they get to hunt, and I'm supposed to stand back and be like, oh, okay, it's good that they get to find it, and they can get some money, and we can put it away. Or... But I want the $10 bill. <laughs> so even though it is supposed to be for them, I still compete, and I still get involved in this. And it's amazing how quickly a $10 bill will make me 10 on a three-year-old boy. <laughs> I, I will go all out to defeat him in this and make sure that it ends up in my pot. Uh, and now that's a funny little story, but this week as we look in James, as we keep looking at what it means to have street level faith, he's going to start talking about money. And it is a passage that doesn't kid around, it doesn't pull any punches. And the reason James talks this way in this passage is because m money has power in our lives. Even small amounts of money. Wealth affects the way that we live. It can affect our hearts. It can affect our minds. And so James wants to see what difference faith makes to the way that we think about wealth, the way that we think about money. If you remember, this is a letter written by Jesus' half-brother James, who is leading the church out of Jerusalem. And he is writing to these Christians scattered all around the Middle East and the Mediterranean, trying to help them understand that if Jesus has did, done what he has done, if they believe that, then that should change the way that they live. If they really believe in the power of the gospel and the cross, in Jesus giving his life, then that should change the way that they speak to others. That should change the way that they look at others. And James uses this very memorable phrase at the start of his letter. In the early chapters, he says, faith without works is dead. He goes on to say that if we are hearers of the word but not doers, then we deceive ourselves. James is saying we are kidding ourselves if we really think that being a Christian is just knowing something. We are kidding ourselves and deceiving ourselves if what we believe is not changing the way that we are living, the way we think about our tomorrows, the way that we look at people sat in the pew right next to us, and the way that we use our money. So if you would like to read with me, we are in James 5, Verses 1 through 6. This is what James writes to us. Come now, you rich. Now I'm going to stop immediately right there because we attempted to read, come now, you rich, and think, oh, this is, this is for the really wealthy rich people. Now if you earn over $25,000 a year, you are in the top 2% of wealth in the entire world. And that's not a lot of money. That's not even really a, living, a livable wage in this country, but $25,000 a year is the top 2% of all wealth in the entire planet. So this passage, despite not immediately feeling like it's written to us, is written to us. It matters to us. What James is going to say concerns us. He goes on to say, come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. 
You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So in the midst of this incredibly graphic passage, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at a false security, a hardened heart, and a better hope. So a false security. In April of 2018, there was uh, an individual from Trinidad who made headlines around the world for the strangest of reasons. His name was Sharon Sukedo, and he was a multi-million dollar real estate mogul in Trinidad. And at the age of only 33, he was gunned down in a gang attack. But that wasn't what made the headlines. What made the headlines was what happened next. You see, Sharon had left instructions for his memorial, for his funeral. And he said that he wanted to be laid to rest in a casket made of solid gold. So he was laid to rest in a casket worth over $50,000 made of solid gold. And as he was laid in the casket, he said, I don't just want to be laid in a formal suit. I want to be laid in my best jewelry. And so he, in the casket, he wore jewelry worth over $100,000. You can see pictures of this online of him dressed in diamonds and rings. His casket was escorted to the funeral by a $150,000 Bentley. And if all this was not extravagant enough, following the funeral, after his body was cremated, he requested that his ashes be doused in Moet Champagne. Moet Champagne is a Danish champagne worth over $4,000 a bottle. And Sharon is not alone in his memorial extravagance. Michael Jackson, the pop star, was said to have been laid to rest in a gold-plated casket worth $25,000. Sandra West, a Beverly Hills socialite, requested that she be buried in her $20,000 Ferrari. That must have been a very complicated funeral, and the whole must have been enormous. But it's strange how many people we could find on a list like this. Because we hear stories about Sharon, we hear stories about Michael Jackson, and we think, that's insane. Why would people ask to be buried in this way? Why would they cover themselves in their wealth and their money and their jewelry. We know instinctively that money does not go with us when we die. Yet the amount of people that would, you would find on a list like this, who even after death cling to and look to money and wealth as some kind of status symbol, is really shocking. So many people with so much wealth and such little awareness that it doesn't go into eternity. James starts this section of his letter that we've just read with an absolutely scathing criticism of wealth and money. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Very occasionally in the Bible, we find passages like this that just do not pull their punches, that lay things out in a very, very serious and hard-hitting way. It's this incredibly extreme warning about wealth, about what await people who put their trust and their hope and their confidence in material possessions See, wealth gives us a false sense of security. When we think that it's going to deliver our happiness, that it's going to protect us from bad things, when we think that it is going to be the hope of our lives, then we are going to be disappointed because we don't realize that there is a deeper problem in life, a deeper problem within our hearts. Now, it's very important to say at the start of this that James's criticism is not against money in general. It's not a sin to be wealthy. It's not a bad thing to have money. That is not at all what James is saying. If you read this passage, notice that he never says anything about gold and silver specifically, only the use of it, only what people have done with it, how they have viewed it, the way that they have trusted in it. The Bible's often misquoted as saying that money is the root of all evil. What the Bible actually says is that the love of money 
is the root of all evil. Not money itself. There are many Christians, many incredibly godly people who are very wealthy. So wealth is not the issue at stake in this passage. It's how we as people think about what we have been given, what we do with it. And James's rebuke of our treatment of wealth tells us a couple of things. The first thing that it tells us is that wealth is fleeting. Wealth is fleeting. That's why our story about Sharon really is is so fascinating because we know that that wealth is not going with Sharon. That no matter how much he dresses himself up in that casket, at the end of the day, he ends up in a plot in the ground that's exactly the same as someone who didn't have any of that. Wealth didn't change the end of Sharon's life. As we talked about last week, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't even know what's going to happen this afternoon. Some of you might have read in the news this week uh, the, a story about a man called Mark Zuckerberg. If you don't know, Mark Zuckerberg is the CEO of Facebook, one of the most popular online social media platforms. And he was in the news because this week he lost the single largest amount of private citizen wealth in economic history. The shares of Facebook plummeted by over 20% in one 24-hour period. And as a result, Mark Zuckerberg lost over $20 billion in a single day. One of the wealthiest men in the world had to find out that his wealth was fleeting. The amount of money that he lost was more than the entire net worth of the Ralph Lauren Corporation. Doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how powerful you are, in the end, wealth will always prove itself to be fleeting. There is no amount of wealth that can sufficiently insulate you from loss or difficulty or a bad day. James also illustrates that because wealth is fleeting, it can't deliver what it promises us. Money and wealth can't deliver what it promises. It is an untrustworthy ally in this life. We are all tempted to think that if we had just a little bit more, if our bank account had one more zero at the end of it, then that would alleviate some of the stress of our lives, that some of the difficulties these, we, that we face would just melt away if we just had a little bit more. We we'll take note of the picture that James uses in this passage. When he's explaining wealth and he's talking about the view that these wealthy people had of it, he says that your garments are moth-eaten. These things that were supposed to cover them and protect them and keep them warm are now falling apart. That's what happens when we trust in wealth to do something that it can't. When we believe in our heart of hearts that money and wealth is what can save us and what can hold our lives together, eventually we'll find it falling apart. See, true joy in this life requires a lot more than wealth. A lot more than wealth. And so if we trust wealth to bring us joy and happiness and security, it will not deliver on that promise, no matter who you are and no matter how many zeros are behind your bank account. The last thing that James does in this opening little section is he reveals that really wealth and money say something about who we are as people. The way that we view it, the way that we use it, is making a statement about what we believe, about how we think about our lives. He says that the corrosion of gold and silver is evidence against the rich. Their corrosion will be evidence against you. What James is trying to communicate to us is that in the grand scheme of eternity, in the long plan, the way that we think about money, the way that we view money, the way that we use money, says something about what is going on inside of our hearts. It says something about a deeper problem that is happening in our hearts. In Psalm 27, uh, the psalmist says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In older cultures, especially in the day of people like King David and King Solomon, people were of the opinion that if you had more, uh, of chariots and horses, then that was a symbol, a demonstration of your wealth, of your security, of your power. 
So nations would amass chariots and horses. And if you read about King Solomon in particular, he had all of these chariots and horses. What the psalmist tells us is that your biggest problem is not how little or how much you have. Don't trust in those things if you know God because you know what is really going on. Your greatest problem, the greatest thing that you face in this life is not how much or how little you have. It's what's going on inside of your heart. What do you trust in? Where do you find your security? Is it in your bank account? Is it in your retirement plan? Is it in the size of your home? Is it in the value of your car? It's easy when we read those things out loud to think, of course not. But I think what James is challenging the church to do is to press a little harder and ask yourself seriously, but really though, what is your trust in? What's your hope in? Do you think that your biggest problem is the number in your bank account or do you understand that it's in your heart? And that's the th second thing that James brings up is a hardened heart. There's a movie released recently uh, by a man called J. Paul Getty. Now some of you, even without the movie, is going to recognize the name J. Paul Getty. Uh, he was at one time in history the wealthiest man in the world. He was an oil tycoon, had millions and millions, if not billions of dollars, and in a tragic turn of events, his grandson was kidnapped and terrorists attempted to extort J. Paul Getty, the wealthiest man in the world. They took his grandson, and to really prove to J. Paul Getty that they were serious about their demands, they cut off his grandson's ear and mailed it to him. Pretty horrible, horrible story. But what was more horrible was J. Paul Getty's response. The media would gather around, all this attention was on the story, what's going to happen? Is he going to pay the ransom? And week after week, J. Paul Getty said, no, I am not paying the ransom. Now remember, this is the wealthiest man in the world. The terrorists were asking for $3.2 million, which in the grand scheme of his total net worth was next to insignificant for the life of his grandson. But he was of the opinion, if I give in, then this is just gonna happen again and again and all my wealth will drain out because of the people extorting me, knowing that I will break if they do this. After weeks, and in fact after months, eventually, J. Paul Getty broke because of media pressure, because of family pressure, because of all numerous different factors, and he paid the smallest amount that was tax deductible for the release of his son which was $2.9 million, a little less than the terrorists asked for. When his grandson was returned home, he called his grandfather to thank him for having paid for his life, and he wouldn't even come to the phone. His grandfather was so bitter in the loss of this money that he didn't even want to speak to his grandson. Wealth has the potential to numb our sense of compassion to dull our sense of kindness, to harden our hearts. James says to the rich, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. James talks about these wealthy people, and he paints this scenario of wealthy people who have defrauded those that have served them those that have helped them build their wealth. And he says that the cries of these people who suffer as a result of your hardened heart reach the Lord of hosts, reach up to heaven and God hears it. God pays attention to the cries of these people. These wealthy people have actively, in some cases, allowed others to suffer so that their wealth can continue. Their financial security can remain exactly where it's at, just like J. Paul Getty. The truth is that the love of money, not money in and of itself, but the love of money will always lead to hardness of heart. If money and wealth is your highest priority and what you desire most in this life, it is going to harden up and make your heart callous. And your actions and your choices and your decisions with how you use your money will never consider first 
of the people. There was a study by a man named Paul Piff at Berkeley. And what Paul Piff wanted to look into was the effect of wealth and social status on relationships with other people, and particularly on generosity. Something that we're all just a little bit curious about. So he did this study and he researched it, and what he found over the course of his study is that the greater the social status of an individual and the higher their individual wealth, the less likely they were to give to charities, to be generous, and to consider others' needs as something that they should think about. Now, I'm not telling that story as if to say, if you are wealthy and you have more money, then that makes you a bad person, right? Again, the message of this is not about having wealth, it's about what you do with it. And what Paul Piff is telling us at the very least is that if you have more wealth, the temptation to put others second is going to be higher. Paul Piff is telling us that at the very, very least, the more money you have, the harder it is to be generous which is very strange because I think most of us would think the more money we have, the easier it is to be generous. My tithing, my giving, my uh, thoughtfulness towards what I can provide for other people goes up the more zeros I have in my bank account. What Paul Piff is saying is that actually the temptation, the bent within you to give and to be generous goes down the more money you have. It gets harder to do that. And that's what James is wanting to warn these people about. He's wanting to warn them the consequences of what happens if the love of money is first in your life. Think of it like fire. Fire is in and of itself a very good thing. We can use it to cook food. We can use it to stay warm. But if we don't think about the possible ramifications of of fire, if we don't think about how it is used and are wise with how we use it, Fire can burn down cities. Fire can get out of control. That's what wealth is like. If we do not guard, if we are not thoughtful about what we have and how we use it, it does something very dangerous. It doesn't just harden our hearts. In the end, it will enslave our hearts if we let it. The Bible portrays money, in some cases, as being a rival to God. It does that because money and wealth have the power to seize control of our hearts, to pull our hearts away from God. Jesus actually said, you can't love God and money. You can only have one master, either God or money. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, our wise mentor, tells us that there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. He is telling us that hoarding and holding on to wealth, loving wealth, is harmful to our heart and enslaves us. Don't think that you are an exception to that rule. No matter what your income level, you are not an exception to the truth that wealth has the power to enslave you. James is so brutal in his assessment of wealth in this passage. He doesn't hold back because he wants the church to understand the power that wealth has if we are not vigilant. If you don't guard against it, it will turn you into its slave and it will harden your heart. You can't serve God and money. One will always be a tool to glorify the other. And the money will be the tool that you use to glorify your God. Or God will be a tool to increase your wealth and to feel better about your wealth. So wealth should not be something we use for ourselves. It should be a tool that we use to display the goodness of God, the love of God. And so the third thing that James points out to us is a better hope. Another thing that happened in April of this year, the same time Sharon, a massively extravagant funeral was occurring, a church in Texas decided to do something a little different. They decided to rethink their budget, rethink how they were using their funds and how they were fundraising and try and do something extravagant. They looked at their community and they identified the needs that were there, the biggest needs financially, and they decided that they were going to do something about it. So they decided that they were going to pay off the medical debt of as many veterans 
and as of many families as they possibly could. This church was able to raise over $10 million to pay off the medical debt of veterans and families in their local community. This is what one article said about it. The medical debt money first went to local veterans who were suffering injuries caused by war. And after every single veteran in the 20 mile radius of each campus was covered, the rest of the money went to other families. Now 4,229 families in the Carrollton, Texas area will receive letters informing them that their medical debt has been completely paid off. The money that the congregation offered up ended up paying $10,551,618 of total debt, debt that was crushing to those veterans and families. This is what the pastor said to his own congregation the Sunday after they'd done this. Can you imagine what those people this week will be feeling when they receive the letter saying that their debt has been completely paid off? I pray a hundredfold that that's how you would feel when you read in scripture that it is finished, that Christ has paid your debt. We've already said that how we use money and wealth is a statement on what is going on in our hearts, on what we believe. Specifically, it makes a statement about what you hope in. This is how James finishes his passage. He says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. That same hard-hitting language about the dangers of wealth. But if we listen, there is a message in those final words about a better hope. There's an inference about something that is better. A better hope means seeing that fulfilled desire now is not necessarily a good thing for us. He says, you have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. And the NLT translation says, you have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. The focus of these people that James was talking to, these wealthy people that he has in his mind, was on what was right in front of them. It wasn't on eternity. It was on how they can be satisfied now, how they can have luxury and good things now. There's a famous pastor who says, live your best life now. But I think that the gospel's message in James's encouragement is our best life is not now. Now is preparation for the life that is to come. Now is our moment, as we talked about last week, to be shaped by Jesus, by what he's done, to be made more like him, to love others, to love God. And despite the circumstances of our life, give ourselves for one another. And sometimes that's not our best life. But it is preparation for our best life. The life that God has for us now is not about satisfying our desires. It's about making him known and being shaped to be like him. In our culture where discomfort and difficulty is maybe the highest enemy then of course, to say that we shouldn't be satisfying our desires now is really an appalling thing to say. To say that our wealth shouldn't be used for our sake right now, if we've made it, why can't we use it on ourselves? Why can't we satisfy our desires now? But again, if the gospel is the root of what we believe, if looking at the picture of Jesus and what he did on the cross and what he calls us to is the guiding principle of our life, then we understand that all the wealth in the world, all the wealth in the world should be used for the glory of God to try and create a picture of who he is. No matter what my bank account says, if we understand that Jesus has secured for us what all the wealth in the world cannot, then we're free to use whatever we do have to make him known. I'm okay because he will sustain me and he will hold me together whether my bank account has enough zeros in it or not. He will keep me until the day of redemption. It says in Psalm 107, 9, 
He satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. God isn't against joy. He isn't against happiness. He just wants to give us something that doesn't run dry, that isn't fleeting. God is not fleeting. So if that's the case, then we need to use wealth to put the eyes of the world on Jesus, to make him known. Our use of our money should direct people's attention towards Jesus. A better hope means using our money and our wealth to point towards Jesus who has given everything for us. That's what the church in Texas did. They wanted to love and provide for their community so that everyone would see Jesus. That's why on the Sunday morning, the pastor got together and said, really, what we just did, what they have felt when they opened those letters and saw that their debt was paid was not about the debt, it was about Jesus. That's why he told his congregation, when you think of how they feel, remember that that's how you should feel when you read the words, it is finished. That's your debt that was paid on the cross. Finally, a better hope means using our gifts wisely while we may. James says in towards the end of this that you fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Another very graphic sentence that seems a little odd. But in James's day, fattened calves would be slaughtered to provide for celebration, for generosity. If you remember the story of the prodigal son, when the wayward son comes home, the father celebrates the return by slaughtering the fattened calf. What James is saying by saying that you have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter is he's saying you have not given when it was time to give. You have not been generous when the hour to be generous was at hand. The sin of these wealthy people was they didn't make generosity a priority. They were happy to maybe give their words to Jesus. They were happy to think about how they might treat others in church relationally, but their bank account was off limits. But eternal welfare is not built out of wealth and money or immediate gratification, eternal welfare is built by the sacrifice and the generosity of Jesus. What do your financial habits say to the world about where your heart is? What does your use of money and your weekly expenditure say to the world about what you treasure most, about what you trust in? I know that if we laid out my weekly expenditures probably most of the elect lists wouldn't point to Jesus. If we certainly, if we took my life and said, how has Andrew used money over the course of his life? I don't think it would point to Jesus. Praise God that God delights in forgiving me for that and giving grace to all of us as we try to figure out what to do with what he's given us. How we use our wealth, no matter what our income level, matters as much as how Warren Buffett uses his money, how Bill Gates uses his money, how LeBron James, how every wealthy person you could think of uses their money. Every income level has room for generosity, has space built into it to reflect to the world what God has done for you. How we use money is a demonstration of what we believe. So let us not let money and wealth be the object of our highest affection. Let's practice generosity as frequently as we can so that our hearts would not be hardened, but that they would be softened. If you believe that God did not withhold his own son for you, then you are free to use your money however God directs you because you can never outgive him. Would you pray with me this morning as we close? Lord, the topic of money is difficult. Learning to trust you in our lack can be difficult. Learning to trust you in our surplus is perhaps even more difficult. But Lord, may we as a church, may we as a family make you our highest priority. May we love you and look to the sacrifice of your son so that we would be freed up to be generous. We love you and we pray this. In your name, amen.